Hey, good morning. My name is Josh Flores Olvera. I am the missions minister here at First Temple. Uh, I also get to get the privilege of being on the teaching team. Uh, and so if you are here for the first time, we want to welcome you. We also want to welcome you if you're watching online. Thanks for joining us from wherever you may be, whether it's uh, on the move in your car, in the comfort of your home. We're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. So uh, last night, my family and I got to watch uh, Remember the Titans. It's a film from the year 2000 featuring Denzel Washington. Uh, he, he plays a coach named Coach Boone. Uh, he's a high school football coach in the early 1970s in Virginia. And one of my favorite scenes is this, the scene where they, they start off at the school and, and they load the football team on a bus all the way and take him to Gettysburg College. And this is typical uh, in a football season uh, to the, the two weeks before the season starts to go away in this kind of this intense time of training uh, in preparation for the football season. But he takes him to Gettysburg College and one morning he wakes them up during the late hours of three in the morning. And he calls them all down, and he, he lets the team know that they're about to go for a run in the woods, and that if they happen to get lost, they can just hitchhike their way back home, uh, because the, the goal is to keep up. So based on the light that is present at the end of the run, you can tell they've been running for a long time, and when they arrive at their destination, Coach Boone uh, lets them know that they are at the site of the Battle of Gettysburg. And there he explains how the team is fighting the same racial battle that those 50,000 young men fought all those years ago. And now that is getting in the way of this team. Well, this portion of the movie uh, parallels a purpose of the wilderness for the Christian. The players of this football team were removed from their environment, from the distractions of their home for a time, a time to have a work done in them. Not only were they learning the X's and O's of the game of football, but in being removed from their environment, they begin to see their teammates as equals, as brothers. And why was this important? Well, because if they were going to arrive at their destination, uh, a championship, they could not do so being the exact same people who boarded the bus. They needed to endure the challenges of training camp to become who they needed to be. You know, there's a similar dynamic here in the book of Exodus. We've started the sermon series uh, and uh, the, the, the story so far has been that the people have cried out to God. God has heard their cries, and we've seen the ten miracles done through the plagues. He's led them through the sea on dry land. He's given them to drink from a rock, because that's where we all drink from, right? And uh, now they have been freed, liberated from the grip of Egyptian slavery. And they have been led into the wilderness. They've been removed from their environment. But see, this is not punishment because, yes, it is hot. Yes, they are hungry, wandering, and thirsty. But they are not wandering in vain. And as we will see this morning, the God of Israel is not going to waste their time in the wilderness. In fact, God has a transformation in mind, but it requires participation. And the people of Israel, like, I mean, let's be honest, like you and I often do, are resisting participation by complaining and groaning their situation. But I, will, I hope that you will see this morning that the wilderness, although uncomfortable, difficult, and oftentimes lonely, is to be endured with integrity 
for the sake of our spiritual formation. Let me say that again. The wilderness, although uncomfortable, difficult, and oftentimes lonely, is to be endured with integrity for the sake of our spiritual formation. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 16, verses 2 through 3. If you want to open up your Bibles, open up your app. It's also going to be on the screen behind me. And like I said earlier, they, they have crossed to the other side. They have uh, been liberated from the grips of slavery. And now they're complaining. So here we are in verse 2. It says this, the whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, if only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out here in this, into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So as we've gone through the sermon series, we have talked about that this Exodus experience, this Exodus journey, is not just the story of Israel, but it is so also the story of Jesus, and it is also our story. But we're going to begin here in the story of Israel because we are in the story of Israel. And so it's pretty clear, right? Like, not only do we read that here in the book of Exodus, but in multiple times throughout the narrative of Scripture, we can see a reference back to this experience. This is a very important, pivotal, character-forming, identity-shaping history. This means something to them. But what's funny to me is what they say in verse 3. And before we all laugh together, I, I want us to go back a little bit into Exodus chapter 2 because unless we understand what's been happening, we won't catch what's funny. So in Exodus chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, then we'll skip down to 23 and 25. It says this, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and saw their forced labor. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his own people, and he looked this way and that, and seeing, that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. Skip down to verse 23. After a long time, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned under their slavery and cried out. Their cry for help rose up to God from their slavery. God heard their groaning. And God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God looked upon the Israelites, and God took notice of them. So if I was an Israelite during this time, and you would have asked me, Josh, what was it like to be an Israelite in Egypt? I would say, it was horrible. I don't know if you've ever gotten beat up, but we got beat up all the time. Matter of fact, the only way to defend ourselves was to take a life. And not only that, we weren't just put to work. It was forced labor. We were slaves. All we could do was cry out to God that, because only he could deliver us. But look at the, how the Israelites remember Egypt. Let's go back to verse 3. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt. Do you remember how good Egypt was? Do you remember how wonderful Egypt was? You know, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill, Josh didn't have to be vegetarian. There was just Miller's barbecue everywhere. <laughs> you remember that? You remember how good we had it back in Egypt? Well, I don't know about you, but that's not what we read. <laughs> to me, there's this huge disconnect between their lived experience and their memory. But the truth is, is that we can't blame them can't blame them for wanting to run back to what's familiar when you're surrounded by uncertainty, discomfort, and you're living day to day. See, they had asked God to deliver them, but not like this. They had wanted God to step into real time, into their situation, but this is not what they had in mind. 
They wanted God to free them from being slaves in Egypt, but not just so that they could be wanderers in the wilderness. The truth is, friends, that rarely do God's interventions in our lives play out the way we envision them. For those of you who've been walking with Christ for some time, you know that it rarely plays out the way you envision it. And when we ask God to be at work among us, we must prepare ourselves to be uncomfortable. I'll say that again. When we ask God to be at work among us, we must prepare ourselves to be uncomfortable. When we ask God, like we do here at First Temple all the time, to be at work among us. We must prepare ourselves to be uncomfortable. So that's the story of Israel. But it's also the story of Jesus. And as we've been going through the series, we've suggested that. So I want to show you two verses. Uh, One is in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1, and then the second one will be in Luke Chapter 2, verse 52. They'll be up on the screen simultaneously. It says this. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tested by the devil. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in years and in divine and human favor. So in Matthew, Jesus has publicly demonstrated his uh, allegiance to the Father, his uh, commitment to the Father by walking in obedience through baptism. And and what is it that happens to Jesus after walking in obedience through baptism? He is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And for those of you who have read that story, he is there for 40 days and 40 nights fasting. And he is tempted by the devil in all sorts of things, but he doesn't concede And what happens to him immediately after this portion in the wilderness? His ministry begins. I wonder if the wilderness was a necessary part of Jesus' spiritual formation. See, here's the thing. Jesus is fully human, and if he is fully human, he has to grow. And that's why I have that Luke verse up there to show you that Jesus had to grow in his spiritual formation. And just like the Israelites, Jesus was led into the wilderness. But unlike the Israelites, who groaned and complained, prolonging their entrance into the promised land, Jesus endured it with integrity. He showed you and I that the wilderness was not something to be feared, He showed you and I that the wilderness was not a place where God is absent or far away, but on the contrary, the wilderness is the place where God is intimately and intrinsically at work in you. So the wilderness, although uncomfortable, difficult, and lonely, was endured with integrity by Jesus for the sake of his spiritual formation. Jesus showed us that we did not have to fear the wilderness. Rather, we could find our identity and our strength there. So we see the story of Israel. We see the story of Jesus. And here we are seeing our story. I was pretty wishy-washy when I first came to know uh, the Lord. I, I was really struggling with that commitment. And finally, when I, I decided to, to say, Lord, have your way, take away whatever you need to take away, some interesting things began to happen in my life. Uh, the first one was God began to work on my language, specifically cussing. And so my experience was that whenever I would cuss, my heart would physically hurt. And when you're 17 and your heart is hurting, that's not a good thing. But I I began to catch up on this pattern, right? I was removed from 
the distraction and I begin to say, God, why is my heart, my heart hurting when I cuss? And in the small, soft whisper, this thought came to mind. I cannot have both salt water and fresh water coming from the same fountain. On top of that, I was a pretty popular dude in high school. I mean, I, I peaked in high school. I mean, what can I say, right? So, and, and, but when I gave my life to Christ, what, what ended up happening was I stopped getting invited to things. I stopped getting invited to go to off-campus lunch with my friends. I stopped getting uh, the attention from the people that I wanted, and all of a sudden I was being left out of things. I, I didn't do anything. Like, I didn't mess up my, my friendships or betray trust or anything like that. But all of a sudden, I began to be left out. And it was such a drastic difference that it began to affect, affect me emotionally. And so I even remember this, this portion where, uh, or this, this specific day where I went and I told my dad, I, told, uh, I said, Dad, I feel so alone. And my dad's response was simple. He says, you're not alone. You're set apart. So I want to be clear about what I'm talking about here. I'm not talking about isolation from community. I'm not talking about being bullied or picked on, and I'm certainly not saying that God is causing these circumstances. I think he uses them. I don't know that he causes them. That got you feeling like you're in the wilderness. What I am talking about is that in the life of the Christ follower, we will go through seasons of life where we are removed from the distractions and commodities that have blinded us to the sin that's in our lives. The sin that we are enslaved to. Why? To have a work done in us. See, the Israelites were told that they had the promised land waiting for them. But without the wilderness, the same people who left Egypt would have entered the land of Canaan with the mentality of a slave rather than a son of God, rather than a daughter of God. Their identity as God's people was not so much about the geographical destination, but about the internal formation. Because anyone who is not set free in their minds is, cannot be free anywhere they go. Well, Jesus had a joy set before him. And because we needed someone to go before us, he was led into the wilderness. And he showed us that the wilderness was not the place where we were reduced to our weakness, but the place where we found our strength. And for us, friends, the wilderness is not a place that you go out and find. It is a place where you are led out. It is the place where the things that don't look like Jesus are chipped away at. And in return, you get the character of Christ worked into you. And the truth is, is that for the rest of our lives, whether we've been following Jesus for five minutes or five decades, for the rest of our lives, we will periodically be led out into the wilderness. But because the, the wilderness isn't sought out, I want to offer you two spiritual formation practices. Because sort of like if, if we were all saying that we were going to go run a marathon together, it'd be, it'd be pretty foolish to not train for it. Right? So, but because the wilderness cannot be sought out, there are practices that uh, we, uh, through uh, looking into the scriptures and, and what's been handed down to us in church history, we have practices that help us train for when we are let out into the wilderness. These two spiritual practices are called silence and solitude. And because of time constraints, I just want to tell you what these are in case these are new to you. But if you go to our First Temple app, uh, there's a list of resources there. There's videos, there's books you can buy, and there's uh, like YouTube videos for you, for you that walk you through those practices. Uh, if you don't know how to download the First Temple app, find a young person and uh, meet, meet somebody for the first time. Um, and that's a great way to meet people in the church. So here, here are the definitions. 
Solitude is the most fundamental of the disciplines in that it moves us away for a time from the lures and aspirations of the world into the presence of the Father. We remove ourselves from the influence of our peers and society and find the solace of anonymity. We discover a place of strength, of dependence, reflection, and renewal. We confront inner patterns and forces that are alien to the life of Christ within us. So that's solitude. Here's silence. Silence is a catalyst of solitude. It prepares the way for inner seclusion and enables us to listen to the quiet voice of the Spirit. Few of us have experienced silence, and most people find it to be uncomfortable at first, but silence is at odds. With the din of our culture and the popular addictions to noise and hubbub, this discipline relates not only to finding places of silence in our surroundings, but also to times of restricted speech in the presence of others. This is from an author named Kenneth Boa in his book, Conform to His Image. That's one of the resources available to you uh, on the app uh, for you to get his book. But that sounds a lot like the wilderness, doesn't it? Times where we can often feel like we are isolated and God is silent. Or we feel that way, right? So why am I giving you these spiritual practices? Because inevitably, you will be led out into the wilderness. And these two practices will help, you, will help you be strengthened in that. So that when you get led out to the wilderness, you will endure it with integrity. The wilderness was a part of Israel's story. It was a part of Christ's story. And it is inev- inevitably a part of our story. And although it is uncomfortable, difficult, and oftentimes lonely, it is to be endured with integrity for the sake of our spiritual formation. Amen.